Previously on Clash Course. Polygamy just means multiple sexual partners, um, not necessarily, but not exclusively either, um, at the, the same time. Four steps down from the, from the first person, there are 31 people, 31 other people involved in this relationship, in this sexual relationship. 31 people passing around chemicals, bodily fluids, and whatever else is in there. What are the odds that 10 rows down where there are 511 people involved, or 11 rows down where there are 1,023 people involved in this relationship, that half of those people are, 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 are using protection? By having the mature adult conversation about previous sexual partners you've had and that the person you're about to have sexual relationships ha uh, with has had themselves, um, we're entering into a completely different category of sexual responsibility. Mm -hmm. How is any of that different from a, a monogamous person? Because it's who... two people having sex forever. A, 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 a scientist who is used to looking at data are comparing that to actively polygamous people who are constantly trying to have sex with multiple people and you are saying that the odds are not greater that polygamous are going to have uh, are going to catch a disease or, or, or suffer in health because of this? It, it's a small subset of the population partnering between and among each other for the most part. If it's between two people who enter that relationship without STDs, there is zero possibility, zero possibility of an STD happening in that situation. There is, no, there is no polygamist relationship in which the possibility of catching an STD is zero. More of your monogamous relationships end before the lifetime of either person is, is, is over than last an entire lifetime. I, I, I grant that. But for the polygamist, the best kind of relationship for him, of her, or for, for him or her is a successful monogamous relationship. People choose things for their lives all the time that is not healthy for them. It is, it is, it is damaging, but they love it. Uh, and, and so I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that that person can't make that decision. I'm not saying that that, uh, that, that person is therefore a bad person because they made that, that decision. I am saying that it is an unhealthy decision. It may be the one they want to make, and I have no right to stop them, but it is not a healthy decision. And, and certainly fight on their behalf. I think that there are certainly emotional and psychological benefits that outweigh the health risks that are associated with uh, alternate behaviors. Go yeah. on. Multiple sexual partners, um, not necessarily... All right, cut that guy yeah. off. Just cut him off. Cut him off. Can, can we... Just, thank you. Let's just stop that. All right. Welcome to Clash Course. My name is Joey Livingston, and you just saw a little bit of what happened last week on our show. Um, I, I, uh, I, I did enjoy being rude in that moment, but I only did it because the, that video wasn't complete. It was over anyway. Uh, and uh, so, anyways, I got to talk more in that video. What I did take away from that video, though, is that I'm starting to look more and more like Genghis Khan um, <laughs> out, outside of the fact that, I, that I'm winning so big time. Um, Greg, how's it going? It's going pretty well. I'm very warm. We have central air in this house, but it doesn't reach this floor, so oh, no. unfortunately, I'm roasting. I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't be doing the show uh, if I was there. Um, let's see. Uh, so you uh, came on to Skype today with a lot of smack talk about how you were gonna you were gonna beat me and stuff. I did. I think at the, the end of the last show, though, didn't you give me the last word on that one? So I, I feel that it might be appropriate for you to uh, to have the opening or I, I don't know. I don't want to don't want to take it away from you because uh, I want you to have your moment before <laughs> I, I crush your hopes and dreams today. <laughs> well, um, I have lots to say on the subject, uh, but I don't want to dominate the show. Um, so, you know. I will offer for you to jump in at this point in time, and will you accept it? Absolutely. Okay. So, last week we before you begin, uh, we are talking about uh, polyamory versus uh, versus monoamory and uh, and um, uh, uh, polygamy versus uh, monogamy. Uh, go ahead, Greg. <laughs> 
<laughs> Thanks. So last week we talked uh, primarily about. I won't, inter- the, I won't be interrupting you anymore. I promise. Yeah. Hey, I, I'm going to punch you in the mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I promise I won't interrupt you anymore. All right. So I, I was going to say, could you be wrong about that? That's that's going to be the, but but you could be wrong. That's my next response if you try to pull one of those out, Joey. And you'll be like, get off the stage. Um, sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm okay. smiling. Last I just promised I wouldn't interrupt you, so I'm trying not to. <laughs> we, we talked about uh, polygamy primarily. We did not really get into polyamory, but there's a little bit uh, in rewatching and rehashing it that I feel I failed to address properly, and I wanted to, get, to go back over that a little bit. One is that as we were talking about polygamous relationships, we assumed that they're non-committed. Now, uh, the... Only difference between a polygamous relationship and a monogamous relationship, by definition, um, is the number of people involved, but not the exclusivity in a, a long term fashion. So, say a triad situation with uh, two men, one woman, two women, or women, one man, or three of any one gender, all in a sexual relationship, a long term committed sexual relationship with each other and only each other is still a polygamous relationship. In fact, that's probably the standard for most of what historical polygamy has been between having a, uh, a situation generally with uh, a man having multiple wives or a wife and multiple concubines. Um, they, and that, uh, I think, was something that I did not address well enough last week, is that we've been assuming this sexual behavior is only as if these uh, this is swinging of some sort uh, random i have not been assuming that i have not been well, assuming that we haven't been assuming it but we've been uh, sort of leaving that as an unsaid assumption sure it is it is one of the possibilities but but i but i it totally is. agree with what you're saying yeah so um i i think when we we go back into that a lot of what was said about the the health risks associated with it can be basically eliminated to the same degree that the health risks associated with a committed sexual monogamous relationship if it is over a long enough period of time. I don't agree with Uh, that. Well, let let me... Well, let me finish. Let me finish. (laughs) (laughs) Um, What I'm saying is that uh, I I think that we need to recognize that a long-term monogamous relationship is still, I'm looking at some statistics from the CDC here, and the average number of sexual partners that a person has in their lifetime for men is 6.1, for women it is 3.6. This is based off of numbers from 2006 to 2008 and a survey of people aged 25 to 44. So who knows, uh, they could be getting friskier as they get older as well. Uh, I wanna know how you make love with six tenths of a person. I well, I could probably. Really? Uh, you can let me in on that. Oh, interesting. There, there's there's rule right. thirty four. Got some crazy stories to tell. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Anyway, I I think that when we we recognize that the typical monogamous relationship is not the first sexual encounter a person has had, um, we can rule out the the imaginary situation I, I admittedly yes it does actually happen and it it is a uh, a very real thing but it's a very rare thing so it's non-representative uh the situation where it is two people who have not had sexual relations with anybody else that are in a committed sexual monogamous relationship for the remainder of their lives and never stray from that yes. situation in any way it is rare but 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 you cannot rule out responsible people who are tested for STDs before they enter into a sexual relationship. That's true. But you also can't rule that out of a committed triad. Also true. So I think what we've established with the the polygamy versus monogamy um, discussion on the sexual side is that there's certainly a spectrum of risks associated with it. There are monogamous relationships uh, that have higher health risks than polygamous relationships and there are polygamous relationships that have higher health risks than monogamous relationships it's not an exclusive situation where where there's a clear cutoff but there's a lot of blending in between there i will grant you that 
on if we were to look at the entire spectrum to absolute promiscuity in a monogamous fashion and absolute promiscuity in a polygamous fashion with n no commitment a or anything along those lines um but exclusivity in any time you are in a relationship be it one night or one year or a decade however long mm -hmm. there is certainly going to be a slightly higher health risk to the polygamous side of that I, I don't follow what actually i would love to take that point but i don't why would there be a oh because i thought you said if we excluded promiscuity no no that's i'm saying on the, when we okay. go to the the most promiscuous side of the the spectrum then yes obviously people that are exclusive for periods of time sure uh, assuming maximum success rates here are yes. going to simply have fewer sexual partners okay. than the other people and therefore that uh, every sexual partner increases your risk okay. and of course uh, exponentially as they have more sexual partners as well so okay. i think that i can grant you that there is when you get to the the highest levels of irresponsibility a a difference in risk but we also have to ask ourselves whether that difference in risk is a significant difference in risk as compared to what it would be if it was just a, a – I mean we have to compare apples to apples. A yeah. monogamous relationship that takes the same kind of responsibility and, and risk factors okay. into their decisions. May, may I um, say a few things here? Sure. Are, is it, are you sure it's okay or do you, do you have some more – the, no, that's okay. that's kind of the point that I was getting at is that we have to compare it apples to apples along that spectrum. We can't we can't try to line oh, them up if it's it, you we know, must well, be, we're going to we, compare we, this one way over here, right, that right. one over there, and it's just not. Sean the Sean uh, this this weekend tried to compare um, uh, uh, two young people in a a monoamorous relationship with five old people um, in a polyamorous relationship. And then he tried to compare them with one having uh, one day a week to get to know each other versus the other one had every day of the week. Um, it took me a while to, uh, to to tell him how those things were not comparable. <laughs> He's not very happy with me right now because I might be lying just a little bit. Uh, <laughs> but uh, um, so I agree. You have to be very careful to compare things and also... Um, let me wipe the dandruff off my shirt here. I have lots of it. I can't win. I cannot win this competition looking like this. Okay. Um, you have to be careful comparing these things. And also, you have to admit that we are using, we are both using our imagination, which is a, a hard thing to admit given the topic. It's very true. Right. But but we are we are going through all these scenarios in our imagination, and we're seeing whether we whether our assessment of those situations agree and then if they don't we talk about why um, but uh, what I want to say is that uh, first of all you're correct that that promiscuity um, throws a wrench in things in both situations um, and uh, as I was watching the 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 video uh, or the the previously you know when I said there's a there's zero chance of, uh, of, of STD uh, with a m monogamous relationship, I was waiting for you, and you kind of, I don't know if you exactly said it, but you kind of vaguely hit on what I was afraid you were going to say, which is, that is also true with a, with a polygamous relationship, given that, that everybody is trustworthy. Um, and, and so, it, it's true. Monogamous, polygamous, both zero chance of STD if everybody goes into that relationship tested, and everybody's trustworthy. What, what I want to do now before we continue is I just want to agree that um, we will take all of the disease-ridden relationships that we talked about last week and we will set them to the side, take all the, all the relationships that are doomed to failure, that are, that are, that are bad because everybody is, um, is just, just having sex with everybody else um, and everybody's a cheater, and I want to set them to the side and just talk about all of the relationships that have potential you know something something good out of it because I'm not saying you cannot get something good out of a polyamorous relationship okay but I but I want to set all the because 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 there's no point in comparing 
a, any good relationship in what we're talking about with a bad relationship that we're talking about. That's obviously comparing apples to oranges, just like you said. So we might as well dabble in the good, don't you think? Absolutely. Okay. However, I do want to note that nobody is perfect and that all of the people in the scenarios that we're talking about have at least a we're, – we're, we're, we're talking about them at least having some sort of long-term relationship, possibly a lifelong relationship, and that even good people make bad choices. Certainly. Okay. So we're just throwing out all the, all the people who could care less what choices they make. Um, but I do want to, the reason why I'm saying this is because I do agree with you that a monogamous relationship, uh, has, uh, that, that is trustworthy, has 0% of STD and a polygamist relationship that is trustworthy also has 0% chance of STDs. Um, however, that is to, to have a perfectly trustworthy relationship in this world is a rare thing would you not agree yes so so what what we have to do is we have to we have to say that you know what is realistic in terms of the common i'm not saying perfectly trustworthy relationships don't exist they do but they are rare so more common than that is reasonably trustworthy relationships in which everyone is likely to uh to be good be good on their word you know what I'm saying? There is. But there's also a factor that's associated with this one that uh, I think is a significant one to consider when we're talking about trustworthiness of monogamy versus uh, polygamy or polyamory. <clears throat> and that is the incentive to hide other partners or uh, other sexual partners. Now, again, um, mistakes happen, but and sometimes feelings develop or attraction develops that you have no control over. It's something that it, it falls outside of the, the scope of most humans' ability to choose the people that they're attracted to or the people who come onto them or, or even directly proposition them. And it certainly does put them into a situation. Say, again, I'm going to throw out a hypothetical here, but <clears throat> as a, a committed married person, having an extremely attractive person to you ask you, very point blank to have sex with you, no strings attached, or to enter into a relationship. Um, we can then, of course, go into the, well, do you have the the wherewithal to make sure things are tested? But I'm assuming that this is a, a heat of the moment, uh, bad decision making kind of a, a trigger here. So I would say that in a polygamous or polyamorous relationship, then there is a higher degree of openness and honesty expected between partners in situations like this uh, because they're not they they don't have incentive to hide the fact that there's a coworker okay now I I, I thought that we to. were now we were no longer talking about swinging but we were talking about a small group of people who had decided that that each of those people in that group were extra special and that they wanted to enter into a an exclusive relationship with with you know amongst three people possibly four to five but that this was a kind of a locked in relationship okay and uh, you're right i did sway a little bit from that but what i i mean by that is if we say you know a small group uh polygamous relationship uh, between three and five individuals that's still something that takes a greater degree of openness and honesty about your uh, emotional state and your your sexual desires for other people, then is what or then is required in a monogamous relationship. Uh, it's something that you need to be honest that you are uh, before you can even get into the situation. Obviously, to go from two people to three people, somebody's got to break that ice, and that is a conversational barrier that still exists in the vast majority of monogamous relationships, something where people are not even comfortable telling their, their partner that they're attracted to somebody else for fear of insulting that person or fear of making them jealous or in some way upsetting them, which leads to keeping secrets and hiding things and creates situations that are more dangerous for bad decisions. It escalates the probability of bad decisions happening because there's 
a, I guess a more more cloak and dagger um, hiding and and I can't come up with the terminology I'm looking for here. But, but I, I thought uh, that I, we I were that, I thought that we were now comparing people in both situations that were reasonably trustworthy. Sure, but what we're saying is to to cons- we're trying to determine what is reasonably trustworthy, right? I mean, I'm assuming that we're saying a reasonable, trustworthy person in a being, committed being trusted, relationship. Not, not, not. We're not talking about being trusted, uh, not to uh, watch um, an adult movie. Not being trustworthy. We're not talking about being trustworthy, not to be attracted in your mind with somebody. Those are conversations all unto themselves. In my in in my book, uh, I thought we were talking about being trustworthy in terms of not cheating, not not going out and physically. I, there's cheating in your mind and there's cheating physically. I thought we were talking about breaking a bond that could cause sexual diseases. I agree. And that's the point that I'm actually trying to get at is that okay. the the emotional and the the psychological attraction to other people is something that will happen regardless of the type of relationship that you're in. It's something that is unavoidable to the vast majority of people. I mean, I, I can't speak for everybody, but uh, I know the day that I put on my wedding ring, I didn't somehow stop seeing every other woman on the planet. Um, they just put out blinders. But I made a commitment to my wife that day. I, well, actually, I had made this commitment significantly before that, but uh, I made a commitment to her to an exclusive relationship romantically and physically. And... I'd assume that the same kind of commitment is being made in a a polygamous relationship that we're making the standard on. However, in a polygamous relationship, if there are three, four, or five people involved, there, again, is a greater degree of openness and and honesty about your attraction to other people, about the emotional and the psychological states. And I think that you and I can certainly agree on the fact that cheating physically generally doesn't happen – before the emotional and the psychological triggers come into play, right? Right. So what I'm saying here is that because the emotional and the psychological triggers are unavoidable, the ability to have open and honest conversations about that, to not feel the need to hide those feelings for fear of insulting a partner, makes it less likely that you'll act upon them in a moment of weakness. Because you feel, for whatever reason, that you could hide it or that this is an opportunity that you can't pass up or, or in what way. I think that being open and honest with your, your spouse is by far the best way to avoid the temptation to stray when that temptation would present itself. To tell them, there's somebody at work who's hitting on me really hard and... I'm attracted to her and I don't feel comfortable with this because I don't want to do anything. I, I'm happy with our relationship to, to be able to have that kind of conversation and not have to worry. Well, what if the is conversation is I do want, self-esteem. what if the conversation is I do want to do something? Then that's still another conversation. I imagine that a, a polygamous relationship is one that obviously, um, has standards or has set the standard that it's possible to add a new partner into the relationship if everybody agrees to it. Um, but a monogamous well, relationship, that is, that is true. Not allow that. But again, we, we, we are talking about a polygamous relationship in which that is unlikely. Well, but I think that that we have to consider the nature of a polygamous relationship being that that is possible and not necessarily frequent, but Polygamous relationships don't start out with four or five people in them. They they happen generally with a monogamous couple that decides to add a third for whatever reason, and then or maybe a, a third okay, and but fourth. It, but if it is a if it is a monogamous couple that is uh, that is looking for for anything of quality and substance and and long lasting, they're not just looking for another sexual partner. So they would be looking beyond the sex to to getting to know a person and understanding whether this is something that would work for them long term so so it would become i would think more and more rare 
that they would that that anyone would allow another person into that dynamic. Uh, well, I I think that you're speaking from a bit of a position of ignorance on that one, um, and uh, just because you have not had any personal experience with it, I I've not had personal experience, but I I know people who have been in this situation. You, you said to me when we began this conversation that we were talking that you thought it was more common that uh, that it was just three. Sure, and uh, obviously the there's sort of a standard deviation that you're gonna. Uh, go through i imagine nine and ten person groups are very unlikely but uh okay. so if i'm if i'm speaking from a standpoint of ignorance then so are you it, to an extent yes i i will say that i mean this is a subject that i chose to speak to you about because it's something okay. that i i'm interested in and i i follow blogs and things by people who are in this situation i find it fascinating is it so, really is it really a, a, an ignorant assumption on my part if we're talking about about quality relationships that a quality polygamist relationship among three people if it were to expand it would involve wanting to know somebody in the long term and know that it would last and know that they fit in that dynamic and that therefore for such a person to exist that could be added to two or for such a person to exist that could be added to, to three that 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 the whether that would work or not would become more and more rare because this person would have to work yes. for everyone so why are you saying it's ignorant for me to say that no no i'm not saying it's ignorant for you to say it i'm i'm saying that you you just i i'm not when i i say speaking from a position of ignorance i'm not saying that you are ignorant in, I, a, yeah, that's in fine. a pejorative sense but that's fine. i just um, want to know I, i'm saying that however you want to phrase it why, have, why is that in uh, ignorance why is that ignorance um well i, I think uh that you kind of rephrased it in a way that fixed what you had said before Did a I? little bit in adding it so I, I really can't say that that what you just said i'm really... gonna get sean the sean who hates me <laughs> to uh to tell me sean did i did I did I repair my statement when I restated it? Is he paying attention at all? Yes. Why don't you don't Why don't you watch watch my shows? This guy, I, I don't understand him. I don't even know why he's here. <laughs> anyway, the the thing that you just brought up though is actually speaking strongly to my point is that you're right. People in this situation would certainly be interested in in looking for somebody if they were even going to consider adding another person to be a long-term committed relationship in the same way that they are. I, mean, I think that that's the assumption we're working under here. Uh, and in that case, that is the conversation that needs to be started somewhere. So if, again, you're in a monogamous relationship with the perpetual expectation of monogamy and something where any sort of sec non-monogamy is taboo, it's not an option in any way, um, by agreement, then there's incentive to hide the feelings and the thoughts that you're having that would make the other person jealous or doubt or insecure or in any way have a detrimental effect to your relationship. There's a, a incentive to internalize those feelings and hide them from your spouse, which can manifest then in other ways um, when when a greater moment of temptation or weakness or maybe alcohol gets involved, who knows? But in a polygamous r relationship, there is actually a real potential that you could find a new partner that could be added to your triad or your quad or whatever group you happen to have. So if you do find somebody that you're attracted to you, or attracted to and you'd like to have this happen, then you have every every rational reason and incentive to go to your group and say, listen, I've met somebody else. I think she or he would be great for us. And that is a, I think, significant difference that we need to recognize exists between a polygamous standard and a monogamous standard in the way that these couples communicate with one another. I'm, I'm sure that that dynamic exists within polygamy. Um, but I'm not sure that uh, you are addressing the issue of cheating. That, that is not cheating. Now, I understand you're saying polygamy leaves things open to where there are less circumstances 
with people at least a little bit less in which it you know in which cheating could be avoided but but what we're talking about with cheating is going out and having sex with somebody who you may not see a long-term relationship with but you are simply um attracted to on a on a primal level I agree. I, and I, I think that that is certainly a, a distinction to be made. But the argument that I'm making is that monogamous relationships have a higher incentive and potential to cheat than polygamous relationships do because in a, in a cheating, by definition, is done without consent and it is done or consent yeah. of your partner being cheated on and it's done in secrecy. I don't, I don't agree. In uh, polygamous the, relationships, what, what there's you, incentive or not incentive to keep it secret. If what, you what, you, what you have to presented to me, Greg, I will admit, uh, I didn't expect, uh, and it's an interesting point, but I don't agree that that means that, uh, that monogamous are, have a higher chance of cheating because, um, regardless of, of your point, um, you still have, two people in a relationship that are expected to be perfectly trustworthy. Whereas in polygamy, you have three or more. And the more people you add, the less likely that all of them are going to be honest for the duration of that relationship. I, you know, I think that you're, you're playing with the, the numbers and saying just basically if you have a 3% chance of cheating or a, a you know, 0.3% chance of cheating per person, then, you know, probabilities being additive in that respect, the more people you add, the higher the chances are. But that's what I'm saying is that if we are going to treat it in this probabilistic sense, we need to recognize that the probabilities of cheating in a, uh, for any individual in a polygamous relationship may very well be significantly smaller by or smaller by significantly enough to counterbalance or even reduce the total okay. number amount so, of risk. So I'm not I'm not discounting your point, but I am saying that that yes, your point in that polygam in, in that in a polygamous relationship the I, the what constitutes cheating changes uh, significantly. Okay? And and so I will, I will accept the counterbalance for the purposes of this argument because I don't want to be so ignorant as to dismiss that that the, the, the point you're making, as to say that it has no value. I I think that it's a smart point, um, but I don't think that it that it says what you say it says, which is that therefore polygamists have a lower chance of cheating, because the math is not to be discounted when you when you have um, you know two good people, uh, the odds of them making, the odds of one of them making a mistake are less than if you have three or five or ten. I think that's pretty speculative, and that's the point that I'm trying to make, is just a counterpoint to that, is that a, while your argument certainly does have a a validity if the the premises are true, mine is just as valid if my premises are true. And without research into it, we can't draw a conclusion on that point. I'm not um, trying to dismiss your point. I, I know. I, I'm, I'm not trying to dismiss yours either. I'm just saying that okay. the, the question here is something that, be, as I, I do have a, a counterpoint to your valid point that you will admit is valid, and we can't right. know which one could potentially be the right one without more research, then it's not something that we can consider as a factor in this this uh, decision without knowing more information about it. Right. Okay. I think though that it's time that we move on. Jesus, this, this topic, we go through it so quickly. Christopher Hitchens. Um, it's, it's now five forty already, but I'd really like to move on to polyamory because we've been talking about sexual relationships here, but at the very beginning, this is the other part. This is how you, uh, bought the farm or gave away the farm or however we, we phrased that in the past is when you made a clear distinction and complete separation between the two and said that it is perfectly uh, valid to consider either one completely separate and devoid of the other. So I'd like to talk about right. monoamory versus polyamory without yes. any sexual considerations. Uh, that's exactly what I want to do. Okay. I Do you mind if I open this one? Well, we have literally five minutes left in the show, so, so I, 
So I'm, I'm at a loss as to this week or maybe maybe we should conclude this. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that uh, I can. I, I'm not sure that I can claim victory on this argument. Uh, I I think that at this point I I would agree with you that we've basically established an impasse that the polygamy versus monogamy is something that is a complex and varied scale um, that we can't necessarily draw a conclusion about yeah. either one in general you without know, I, more specifics about I, any. I, I think that this is a good opportunity for me for, for, for me and, and us. And one day, by the way, I want to talk about a subject that I want to talk about is how we talk, how we argue, how we debate. I want to stop and have a show or two talking about that topic, how you and I argue and debate. Okay. Uh, Sean and I had an interesting discussion about that this weekend, and I thought it was—I uh, thought it'd be great for you and I to have a similar discussion. But, but for now, I—I I, I do want to do that just a little bit because I want to talk about something that I learned years ago in arguing with people that I had to become comfortable with if I was going to be an honest person when I was when I was talking with people, or at least try to to get there, because it is hard uh, for most people to admit that they're wrong or to admit that they're losing an argument or to admit that they're not making any headway, uh, particularly, um, and maybe I'm just being uh, racist here, but particularly for Christians, um, they have a hard time doing that because they feel like they're representing something so much bigger than themselves. Um, and uh, as a Christian, uh, you know, because I, I, I was one, um, I still wanted to have an ar honest argument with people. And one thing that I realized one day and that I had to keep reminding myself is that it's okay to lose an argument. Losing an argument doesn't mean that you are on the wrong side and you need to change your mind immediately. All that it means is that you have been given something, probably a gift, uh, that you need to spend some time thinking about. I, I like to think of what we do as uh, sort of a dialectic. Um, I, I think it was uh, Plato. I was just about to Google that because I don't remember uh, if that was the case. But the, the dialectic is a, a conversational or, or even debates tactic where, or not tactic, but style, where the goal is to grow mutually in the understanding of a topic by bringing multiple viewpoints to it. And that's what I think that you and I do really well with the show. That is very interesting really that you would it. say that. That is very really? interesting. Really? Yeah, because that's that's something that, uh, that, that, that Sean and I talked about this weekend. I, I really, really want to talk about this with you, but, uh, but um, that it's just there's not enough time. But I do want, you know, one thing that I really want our audience to take away from this show is to, is to be able to separate in their mind the idea of not winning an argument from the idea of just being dead wrong. The two are not the same thing. I may be, I may be dead wrong, but <laughs> this, this argument, I'm okay with, with giving it up, but it doesn't mean that, uh, that polygamy is better than monogamy or that they're even, um, or that, or that, you know, polygamy is just as healthy Maybe it is, uh, but uh, what I am going to what I am going to admit here is that I don't think that I've won this argument. <laughs> well, thank you. I, I can't say that I've definitively won the argument either. But uh, what's nice with uh, the tendency that we do have, and I, I'll admit that I I look at these things as a dialectic in spirit, but in practice, what we actually try to do is one up one another and win uh, with whatever sneaky underhand tactics we can, and that's that's okay too. Um, so my sneaky underhand tactic that I like to bring to the table is letting you make the positive claim so that the burden of proof is on you. And therefore, all I have to do is make sure you don't win. And then I win by default. Kind of. It, uh, it works out much nicer when I don't have to prove my point, just disprove yours. Yeah. I don't, I don't think that I did a, 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 a super good job, uh, arguing the position of, uh, of monogamy being best, but next week we will talk about monoamory, and um, I will say this: that uh, that if I do a good job on that, that I then want to, after we're done with that, 
I want to bring the two together because although I wanted to separate them, it was only for organizational purposes. Um, but one cannot deny that the two exist together. So uh, certainly. So you know, after we after we argue it through, let's put them back together and then see what we have. I absolutely agree. I think that. Uh, honestly, watching back through last week's show, the understanding that I had was that we spent a, a lot of time talking about polygamy um, and not the the polyamory. We were talking about sex and not love. And obviously, I, I think given the nature of the way that we've been treating, especially in today's conversation, sex as something that is a part of a committed relationship in, in a long term, we've already, in a way, been treating the two together. So I'd like to re-separate them and look at just the love side of it and the, the multiple versus or binary concepts of love and of affection to see where that can take us before we do recombine them. All right. So before we go, what I want you to do is repeat after me. Are you ready? Yep. Okay. Repeat this. Do, 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 do. <laughs> do, 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 do. Monogamy. See you next week. Ha, ha, ha.